this is the um the, actually it's the third segment because we did an introduction to ephesians so it doesn't count as one it is one before ephesians not one after ephesians which we did last week so now we're going to do two after ephesians in the great year 2023 we'll be looking at the rest of ephesians one starting with the verse three and we understand that the key to the whole trustees of ephesians is stated in verses three and four of chapter one so if you understand this you can take the next few weeks off Blessed is God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, even as he has chosen us in him, in the Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy or sanctified and without blemish before him. The receiving of every spiritual blessing is in the past tense, meaning that every individual in the church has already received them. The location is in the heavenly realm through Christ. God's purpose in Christ Jesus was what he made Christ to be for the believers and what God made the believers to be in Christ. The Greek reads, into us, uh, oh, that's Latin, sorry. Into us, eporionios, and it means in the heavenlies or in the heavenly places or in the heavenly realm. And it's a phrase that occurs five times in the book of Ephesians. And we'll go through all of them, but just so that we get the um, the syntax properly. When an adjective is used as a noun, the necessary noun may be supplied. That's why the word place, places, or realm is supplied. Since it is in the heavenly realm, and realm is in italics, only it was added, it is set in opposition to anything that's earthly. So you will see it translated, you know, in heavenly places or in a heavenly place and it's because of grammar so ephesians 1 20 and 21 now which he energized in the christ when he raised him from the dead and caused him to sit at his right side in the heavenly realm far above every ruler and authority and power and lordship even every name that is named not only in this age but also in the coming age the heavenly realm of god is set far above and in contrast to ruler, authority, power, and lordship of verse 21, which are earthly realms belonging to the God of this age. Likewise, in chapter 2, Ephesians 2, 2 through 6, you formerly walked in those things according to this worldly age, according to the ruler of the authority of the atmosphere, the ruler of the spirit that now that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Likewise, we all had our manner of life among them formerly in the cravings of our flesh, doing the wills of the flesh and of the mind, and by nature we were children of wrath, even as the rest. However, God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you are saved or delivered. And he raised us up together and caused us to sit together in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. See, verses 2 and 3 describe the adversary's use of earthly power to disrupt our lives. Then verses 4 through 6 discuss God's use of heavenly power to deliver us through the heavenly realm or through that which is truly heavenly with no earthly power involved. Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. To me, who am less than the least of all holy, sanctified ones, was this grace given to proclaim the gospel regarding the untraceable riches of Christ to the Gentiles and to enlighten all people regarding what is the administration of the mystery which has been hidden from the ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the multifarious wisdom of God could now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm, in accordance with the purpose of the ages, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God wants the untraceable riches of Christ and the multifarious wisdom of God known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm in accordance with God's purpose of the ages, the Christ. He was the purpose of the ages. Since the church is the agent 
which is to make known the multifarious wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities, it again sets the heavenly things as opposed to the earthly. The church uses the heavenly things to carry out its tasks, not the earthly, the heavenly things. Ephesians 6, 11, and 12 is the, is the fifth place. Clothe yourself with the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. Because to us, the wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in the heavenly realm. It's interesting that the Aramaic reads, against the spirits of the wickedness under or beneath heaven. The, the fifth usage in Ephesians, again, sets the heavenly realm in contrast with the earth. It also clarifies why we have been, why we have to put on the whole armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but by utilization of our spiritual weapons. There is nothing, nothing earthly, sensual, or devilish about our armor. And the Aramaic reads under heaven, which strengthens the truth that the devil and his hosts are not heavenly in, heavenly in influence, but they are indeed earthly and sensuous and devilish. All right, Ephesians 1, 4. Even as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, sanctified, and without blemish before him. This verse reveals three of our many spiritual blessings. We're chosen by God, we're holy, and we're without blemish before him. Jesus Christ presents us as holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. Not because of our works, but because of his perfect sacrifice, because of what he accomplished for us. Hebrews 9, 14, Then how much more will the blood of the Christ, who, because of the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, he can cleanse our or your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. The understanding of the phrase foundation of the world in Ephesians 1 4 has been through a series of revisions. The Greek is katabole, a casting down, founding, or establishing. And 1 Peter 1 20 has similar information. The cognate verb katabolo, katabolo means to cast down. The verb is used with the noun themelios, which means found, which is foundation in Hebrew 6 1. So it means to cast down a foundation or to lay a foundation. Similarly, the noun katabole was used to refer to a casting down or a casting down foundation or a laid foundation. But here it's used with the Greek word cosmos. And the cosmos is the physically ordered world. The casting down or laid foundation of the physically ordered world does not necessarily refer to the beginning creation of Ephesians, of Ephesians, in Genesis 1-1. There was a foundation of the physically ordered world laid out again in Genesis 1-3 to 2-3, after the earth had become without form and void. Another foundation of the physically ordered world was laid in Genesis 3-22-24, after the fall of man. Understanding that there would not have been a need for people to be chosen in Christ before the fall of man, suggests that before the foundation of the world would refer to the promise made in Genesis 3.15, just before this establishing of a different physically ordered world that started in Genesis 3.22 and 24, which had an order different from the previous world. Right, because starting, uh, you had the first one, Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, then 1, 3 to 2, 3. That was the, the next foundation of the world. And then starting in 3, 22, God laid out, chased Adam and Eve out of the garden and set up for the next uh, order, uh, order, order of the world, the order of the cosmos. Uh, but 315 came before him setting that up. And that's why it's before the foundation of the world. Now, the promise regarding the Christ to come is first stated in Genesis 3.15, Bob. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God's choosing was in him, in Christ. He determined at the time of Adam's fall what he was going to do for mankind by the seed of the woman. 
Then God reordered the physical world. Those who would believe in the Christ, the seed of the woman, were to be justified from Adam's sin and condemnation as described in Romans 3, 20 to 5, 21. Those who believe in the church are holy without blemish, without blame, without visible defect, as was required of sacrificial animals and of priests under the Mosaic law before him. The Greek word for before, so that's foundation of the world, and that's that's got a uh, different name. It's been upgraded again, as I said. All right, but the Greek word before, of course, is katanopio, katanopion, being in the sight of or directly in the face of God. The emphasis is on the presence, its visibility, rather than on its location. It denotes eyesight presence, not just being in the vicinity of God, we are directly in the sight and presence of God. We are before God. We are directly in his sight. We're directly in his presence. Abraham, though, he was in the vicinity of God. We are directly in the face or presence of God. We are holy without blame before God. Directly in the face. Directly in the presence of God. That's why we can come boldly to the throne of grace. You know, when you raise your hand, God goes, yes. <laughs> he sees you. Abraham negotiated directly with God. Remember for Sodom on Lot's behalf? So it wouldn't be destroyed. Started with 50, got, got, got down to 10. All right. We are directly in the presence of God. He was just in the vicinity. So do you think maybe you can discuss things openly like that before God, your father? Holy and without blame is the figure of speech of pleonasm where redundant phrases and, and clauses are used. If you're holy, you're going to be without blame. God put double emphasis on it. You are holy and without blame. Well, if you're holy, you, yeah, you're without blame. That's the figure. Holy is all that's needed. You're holy, you're holy. Then why without blame? You know, that's why without blame would be redundant. And that's why it's a figure. It's like bless and curse not. Well, if you bless, you won't curse. It's redundant. Same figure. But sometimes God needs to get his point across. And he uses a figure of speech. Ephesians 1 5. In love, he determined beforehand. Pro, pro, yeah, yeah, that word. Prozeria. Jeez. Anyway, that's an Italian. He's lived down the street from Bob. Uh, he determined beforehand for us to have sonship to himself through Jesus Christ in accordance with the good pleasure of his will. So that Greek word. Pro orizo means to mark out the boundaries beforehand, to decide or determine beforehand, kind of like election sometimes. Oh, wait a minute. It is used of what God previously determined in the Christ for mankind. It is used here regarding sonship in Romans 8, you know, like it is in Romans 8 29. Now, the Greek word translated sonship is huathesia, meaning sonship. Hey, imagine that. It means a placing as a son, but not by adoption, as it's been translated in the King James Version. It refers, as it also does in Romans 8, 15 and Galatians 4, 5, to being sons of God by the spirit nature received from God. This sonship becomes available through the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. We look at Galatians 4, 4 to 6. However, when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son who came from a woman, who came under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the sonship, making us sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, shouting, Abba, that is, Father. And Romans 8, 15. So you have not received a spirit of bondage again to cause fear, but you have received a spirit of sonship making you sons, whereby we shout, Abba, that is, Father. Boy, we should be right there in God's face, God's presence, Abba. <laughs> you know, the usage of the word spirit refers to the life of man, its issues and characteristics. Bondage is dulia, which means servitude, slavery, or bondage. Mankind has not received the soul life of servitude that leads to being fearful, being bound up with fear, living a fear-centered life, but rather a life of confidence where we can shout out to our Abba, our spiritual father for help and guidance. 
2 Timothy 1, 7, working translation. I bring this up, and you'll see why. Moreover, God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love and, a so and, and of sober thinking. The usage of the word spirit here is just like it is in Romans 8, 15. It, uh, it refers to the life of man, its issues and characteristics. The Apostle Paul encourages Timothy to not allow his soul life to be one of, one of cowardice, to be one of timidity, but rather to live with a renewed mind based on power, love, and sober thinking. I know it's been taught it's this devil spirit. Well, no, it doesn't fit. This usage of spirit fits much better. Your, your, your lifestyle is timid, you know, almost coward, see? But again, if you see Timothy's history, he was a youngster, and his mom and grandma had been in the, were raised in the Word. And so he was, he was timid around the older people. Plus, his dad was a Greek, wasn't even circumcised yet. So he had, he was a little timid. He was a little coward. He, he wasn't as bold as he needed to be, and Paul's encouraging him to be that way, just like in Romans 8. We didn't get a, a spirit of bondage, a spirit of slavery, the for fear. God's not in the business of giving us fear. So we don't need to be living a lifestyle of being fearful in bondage uh, to it all our life. Now, um, see, the usage of the word spirit under 2 Timothy 1, 7 here also refers to the life, and, and it's so big. So replace that non-boldness with the boldness with a power love and sober, sober thinking ephesians 1 6 as we move on uh we got one to the praise of the glory of his grace or favor by which he highly favored us care to he highly favored us in the beloved one who's the beloved one jesus christ now the greek word care to means to show grace to to highly favor it is a cognate verb of the noun charis meaning grace or favor. The verb form only occurs here, and when the angel Gabriel greeted Mary and said, greetings, highly favored. You know, see, God created a pregnancy in Mary where there was none. Thus, it includes bringing something into existence that has no reason for being than it was God's will. It was God's will to choose us and put the Spirit in us, to create the Spirit in us. How about Luke one twenty eight? Hail, thou art highly favored, Cherito, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And then Ephesians 1, 7 and 8, as we continue, in him, in the beloved one, we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace or favor, which he caused us, which he caused to abound unto us with all wisdom and prudence. God has caused us to abound. God has is the one He's caused us to abound in grace, wisdom, and prudence. Prudence is good sense. He's caused us to abound in good sense. So when we do stupid, anyway, uh, if a man's prudent, he's got good sense. It's an attribute or result of wisdom concerning practical application. Psalm 49, 6 to 8. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. Or it's forever unachievable. Uh, men's wealth or riches as a ransom for his brother ceases forever, or is forever unachievable. The best that man can offer for the redemption of mankind could never achieve it. The gift of grace is so costly that it can only be given, never earned. It is so valuable, it has to be free. Ephesians 2.8, by grace you have certainly been saved or delivered through believing, and this salvation is not, is not from yourselves. It is the offering of God. Redemption is deliverance from the dominion of an alien power and the enjoyment of the resulting freedom. Redemption includes not only the deliverance from bondage, but the enjoyment of freedom and blessing. Israel was delivered from bondage in Egypt and delivered unto freedom and blessing in the promised land. The benefits of our redemption today are only a foretaste of our complete redemption, which is still future. Biblically, 
It is intimately associated with the ideas of ransom and substitution. It often involves the idea of restoration to one who has a more fundamental right or interest. It is a releasing, deliverance, or liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. We have been redeemed from the curse of the law, and this redemption, this buying back, was through Christ's blood, which gave us sonship. Romans 3, 23 to 25. In fact, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set before himself to be the place of expiation and conciliation in his blood through believing. This he did with a view to a demonstration of his justice by the passing over of the previously committed sin in the forbearance of God. The full manifestation is the redemption of the whole body of Christ. And that will happen at Christ's return in the future. Romans 8, 22 to 24 tells us, Thus we know that all the creation groans together and travails together as in childbirth until now. Not only does it, but even we ourselves who have the first fruit, which is the spirit, groan within ourselves, waiting for the inheritance of sonship. That is the redemption of our body. In fact, we were saved or delivered in, unto hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Why would anyone hope for that which he sees? This redemption is a release effected by payment or ransom. Jesus Christ died for us. That's why it is through Christ's death. Christ's blood shed for us is the cost of our redemption. But he shed his blood. But the cost then is he died for us. That was the result of shedding his blood. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. He has made known to us the mystery of his will in accordance with his good pleasure, which he himself purposed, prothesis, in him, the Christ, so that in the administration of the fullness of the times, he might bring all things together under one head in the Christ, that is, the things in heaven and the things upon the earth in him, the Christ. The plural of the Greek word meaning heavens is often used to refer to the singular heaven. God has made known to us the mystery of his will. The Greek word mystery, mysterion, was a common term in Greek religion for divine secrets. Truths which were undiscoverable, undiscoverable until they were revealed. Only those highly trusted and thoroughly purified could know these secrets. In Latin, the word for mystery is sacramentum. Sacraments. Sacraments such as the Eucharist came to be regarded as mysteries that no one could really understand. And these replaced the true mystery of God, which was soon lost. Moffat translates mysterion in this verse as open secret. Unlike the mysteries in the pagan religions, which could only be known by the few initiated ones, the mystery of God has been made known to all. Ephesians 3.9. And to enlighten all people regarding what is the administration of the mystery, which has been hidden from the ages in God, who created all things. He might bring all things together, gather together, and it's, oh, this is a good one. Anakafido, yeah, yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Anyway, what is it? Aneki phileo, something like that. Uh, meaning to reduce under one head, hence to sum up, to gather into one, to bring all together under one head, like Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. Everything is put under the one head now. He get, uh, bringing all things together, gathering everything together. And that Greek word tells us that. Put it all together under one head. Today, Christ is the head or the body. We move on to verse 11 of chapter uh, Ephesians 1. In him, the Christ, we were also chosen which was determined beforehand, pro orazo, in accordance with the purpose, pro thesis, of him who works all things according to the liberation of his own will. It was through God's deliberation, or counsel, bule, intense desire. It was his decision as the result of his deliberation. He, God, wanted to do it, so he did it. How foolish it is then for man to try to figure God out or argue with God. 
Man's responsibility is to believe God's revelation of himself and receive with joy what God has made available to him. The Greek word, kleruo, translated into King James as, we have obtained an inheritance. Basically, it means to choose by lot or just to choose. The cognate noun, kleros, means lot, part, portion, as the lots used in making a choice or as the part that is chosen. The verb here, of course, it's in the passive voice. You probably figured that out, which means we were chosen. This mention of being chosen reaffirms what was said in verses 4 and 5. God chose us. We were chosen. So it's passive. We didn't do anything. We were chosen. We just agreed with it. The Greek word proazo, to mark up the boundaries beforehand, to decide or determine beforehand, is easier to understand than you were predestinated, Luke. Um, being predestinated, as it's stated in the King James, it's much, it just, you know, determined beforehand. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. All right, I determined beforehand this teaching and sent it to you. Romans 8, 28 through 30. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, that is, to those who are called ones in accordance with his purpose. Because those whom he foreknew, he also determined beforehand, pro orizo, for them to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Moreover, those whom he determined things beforehand, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. According to these verses, what God determined beforehand was that the called ones who love him were to be conformed to the image of his son and thus his son's brothers. First Corinthians 12, 7. However, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery regarding the hidden wisdom that God determined, uh, be determined before, pro ritzo, the ages, he determined before the ages for our glory. The word purpose in Ephesians 1.11 is prothesis, which is the setting before a purpose or a plan. The cognate verb occurred in Ephesians 1.9, and here are two other places that we find that. Ephesians 3.10 and 11, so that through the church, the multifarious wisdom of God could now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm in accordance with the purpose, the prothesis of the ages which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's also in 2 Timothy 1.9. Who saved or delivered us and called us with a holy, sanctified calling, not, only, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, prothesis, and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the time of the ages. Through the Christ we were chosen, being determined beforehand, in accordance with God's purpose, who works all things according to the liberation of his own will. Ephesians 1.12, we move on. That we who previously hoped in the Christ should be under the praise of his glory. To hope beforehand or previously is used here to refer to those who had previously had hope with regard to Christ's first coming. Verse 13 tells us, in him in the Christ, you also, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation or deliverance, having also believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The gospel of your salvation, Euglion, the, the evangel, the good message, or joyful proclamation. Salvation is soteria, meaning salvation or deliverance. There are different kinds of salvation or deliverance mentioned in, in the scriptures. In the context of each occurrence must be considered to determine what kind is referred to. Here it's used to refer to deliverance from the condemnation brought about by Adam, which is discussed in more detail in Romans 5. After they heard the word of truth, they could believe. You cannot believe until you first hear the word of truth. Hearing the word is prerequisite to believing it. Now in the East, a man's seal was his word of honor and, and power, and was more important than a signature. This seal was often set in a signet ring. Seals served several functions. They were a mark of authority and authenticity. They were used to confirm or establish covenants, contracts, agreements, or transactions. They were used to enclose and secure things. 
to protect and prevent interest by unauthorized persons. They were the mark of ownership. The word seal was used in reference to circumcision and the covenant God made with Abraham. We see this in Romans 4.11. He even received the sign of circumcision as seal of the justness of that right way of believing while he was in uncircumcision, so that he through uncircumcision might be the father of all those who believe that justness might be set to their account. Physical circumcision was the seal for Abraham and later for his progeny. It confirmed the covenant and marked out Abraham and his seed is belonging to God. Today, our seal is the Holy Spirit of promise, and it's far greater than that which Abraham was sealed with. All right, verse 14, what, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the acquisition unto the praise of his glory. Until we completely enter in and take possession of our full inheritance, until then, we just have the Erebon, the earnest, the token, the down payment of our inheritance. Bible, read two verses that tell us that. Who also sealed us and given the earnest, Erebon, of the Spirit in our hearts. In 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, now he that hath wrought for now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest, Erebon of the Spirit. The word redemption is a threefold usage here. Our redemption from the world, our physical redemption or deliverance today, and thirdly, the redemption of our lives in the future. All of this is unto the praise of God's glory. Hebrews 9.15, for this reason, he is also the mediator of the new covenant, a death having taken place for redemption concerning the transgressions against the first covenant, so that those who have been called might receive the promise, or what was promised of the eternal inheritance. So, what are we to do now that we have been redeemed? I like the way Psalm 107 2 states it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. This acquisition, this purchased possession, is the literal marking off of a property. It means to encircle, like putting a line or a fence around a property. Remember, we're Remember where Satan criticized God for putting a hedge around Job? Well, that's this word. Here, Job 1.10, the first part of the verse. Hast thou not made a hedge about him? Here's the adversary whining to God. Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? See, this word carries the idea of an acquired possession, which is in circle, which is marked off, which is fenced around. We are set apart. We are compassed about with a line as God's property. God has put a hedge around us, about us. That's why the adversary absolutely has no legal rights to intrude into any believer's life. It's electrified. Anytime he tries to get close. We are a marked off special treasure to God. It's the redemption of the marked off treasure. The holy and faithful in Christ Jesus to whom this epistle was written were people who had heard the word of the truth, the gospel of salvation, and who had already believed in Jesus Christ. They had already received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was the seal and the token of their inheritance to come. They were already blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm in Christ. They were holy without blemish. They were sons of God. They had redemption and forgiveness of trespasses. All these things were done for them in accordance with God's purpose in Christ Jesus. He started that back in Genesis 3.15. There are two great prayers in Ephesians. Okay, The first is uh, in chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, and the second we know is the pivot point in this uh, between the doctrine and practical of the book of Ephesians, and that is Ephesians 3.14 to 21. So let's read straight through this prayer in Ephesians 1.15 to 23. Wherefore, ever since I heard of your believing in the Lord Jesus and your love, to all the holy sanctified ones, I do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge, the acknowledgement of him. In other words, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that 
you know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the holy sanctified ones, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. That power is according to the working of the strength of his ability, which he energized in the Christ when he raised him from the dead and caused him to sit at his right hand, at his right side in the heavenly realm, far above every ruler and authority and power and lordship, even every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the coming age. He put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all people. I do not cease emphasizes Paul's great diligence in prayer. Whenever Paul thought of these believers, he thanked God for them and prayed on their behalf. He apparently did this over and over again. The Apostle Paul expressed a similar attitude towards the saint in Colossae. The I do not cease is in verse, six, uh, verse 16 up front up there. I do not cease giving thanks for you. And so I'm starting with that. So I don't cease. Paul likes to pray. He's told the Colossians, believe the same thing. Colossians 1, 9 to 12. For this reason, we also, from the day in which we heard of it, do not cease to pray. For, do not cease to pray for you and to make requests that you may be filled with the knowledge or acknowledgement of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, with the result that you walk worthily of the Lord with all desire to be pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge or acknowledgement of God, being empowered with all power, according to his glorious strength and all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who made us competent for a part and the share of the holy sanctified ones in the light. Thanksgiving is given for what has already been done or for that which is already a reality. Prayer requests are for that which is possible for a believer to receive but have not yet been realized. We ask God to give or to do something he has not yet given or done. That's uh, what a prayer request, a supplication is. Thanksgiving is really thankful. Look at what God's done for us. Ephesians 1, 16 and 17. I do not cease giving thanks for you. There it is. I do not cease giving thanks for you. There it is. I do not cease no. okay. making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge or acknowledgement of him the father of glory is to be glorified he is to be praised in Acts 7 2 he is called the god of glory or the glorious god or the god to whom the glory belongs god is not some far off god he is near and that's why he's the god of glory the word revelation is in the genitive case in greek and therefore, both wisdom and revelation are describing the spirit, the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, or the spirit that is to say the revealed wisdom. And knowledge is epigenosis, which includes the idea of recognition or acknowledgement of the thing known, that full, precise, complete knowledge. Verses 18 and 19, in other words, that the eyes of your heart, what a beautiful figure, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you know what is the hope of this calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the holy ones, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. That power is according to the working of the strength of his ability. That spiritual inherent potential power is according to the energizing of God's strength. Is, um, is is according to the energizing of God's strength of his powerful ability in every born-again believer. God has powerful ability resident amongst every one of us. The Greek word kratos plus ischus, ischos, mighty power, translated. Let's put it in English. I like that better. Those words are synonyms, and they may be, be, tra be translated strength of ability, referring there to the strength of God's ability to prevail. These words, these words also occur in Ephesians 6.10. All that power is only usable, though, 
to those who believe. Sitting there, right? You got it. But when you start utilizing it, believing it and utilizing it, then it starts coming into fruition. Hope requires believing and patient endurance. We are to lay hope upon the hope set before us. The hope is a strong and secure anchor of the soul. Hope keeps us tied down and prevents us from drifting in life. Hope gives us the true perspective on life and keeps us from getting caught up in circumstances which are only temporary. First John 3, 1 and 2. I mean, 2 and 3. Beloved, we are children of God now. And although it has not been revealed what we shall be, we know that when he, Jesus Christ, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Part of our hope is that when Christ appears, we will be like him, with a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. When we set our hope upon Jesus Christ, we will keep ourselves pure, even as he is pure. We will not be contaminated by the world, for we will live our lives not for what the world has to offer us today, but for that which is greater, the things that are eternal. May God give unto each of us the spirit of revealed wisdom so that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened so that we may know the hope of his calling. In verse 17, God told us that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ absolutely would give us full spiritual knowledge and full spiritual revelation by the operation of the manifestations out of God's fullness, out of God's full knowledge and wisdom. We do not know everything God knows. Do I have to repeat that? We do not know everything God knows, but God, out of the fullness of his knowledge, gives us that which we need. Why does God do that? Well, that's verse 18. For the purpose of it, to the end that, on account of, that the eyes of your heart, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. God wants us to be enlightened. He wants us to know. The eye is a gateway. It indicates undivided loyalty. An act of mind focused on the light of God's word is required for the believer's eyes to be enlightened. Without the word, you stay in darkness. For the eyes to be enlightened, it takes renewed mind effort upon the already written word of God and God's revelation to faithful believers. 20 to 23 now, which he energized in the Christ when he raised him from the dead and caused him to sit at his right side in the heavenly realm, far above every ruler and authority and power and lordship, even every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the coming age. He put all things in subjection under his feet, made him head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all people. Christ fills all things in all people who have believed in him, Therefore, they are completely full, Colossians 2.10. And you are completely filled in him, who is the head over every ruler and authority. God fills all members of the body with all spiritual gifts and blessings through Christ. The body is filled in two ways. First, with every spiritual blessing, the time of the new birth, and the entire body of Christ with all of its members, which will be completely full at the return of Christ. The body is the fullness or complement of the head, and he fills the body. Any member of the body of Christ acting independently then of the head cannot walk with the power of God. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. The born-again believers make up his body. It's still forming. Those who have died are part. We are part. And the future believers are a part. We are all members in particular. God sees us all, but we see those things just around us. That is why the dead in Christ will be raised first, because God hasn't forgotten them. He's not going to leave them in the grave. We can have the eyes of our heart enlightened so as to know the exceeding greatness of God's power that he energized when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his own right hand, far above every ruler and authority and power and lordship, even every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the coming age. This power is now available to any who believes. 
After making request to God that the saints may be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of God, so that their eyes may be enlightened, he asked for three specific things that they might know. First, they are to know the hope of God's calling. Secondly, they are to know the riches of the glory of God's inheritance, his share or portion that he has in the saints. And thirdly, the exceeding greatness of God's power to us who believe. It is only fitting that the truths contained in this marvelous prayer are contained in the epistle to the Ephesians, the apex of all revelation. So we broke all these verses up into smaller parts and looked at different words in more detail. So let's read them all together. So Bob, you're on. Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the holy, sanctified ones who are at Ephesus and faithful, believing in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Even as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, sanctified, and without blemish before him. In love, he determined beforehand for us to have sonship to himself through Jesus Christ in accordance with the good pleasure of his will unto the praise of the glory of his grace or favor by which he highly favored us in the beloved one, Jesus Christ. In him, the beloved one, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace, favor, which he caused to abound unto us. With all wisdom and prudence, he has made known to us the mystery of his will in accordance with his good pleasure, which he himself purposed in him, Christ, so that in the administration of the fullness of the times, he might bring all things together under one head in the Christ, that is, the things in heaven and the things upon the earth, in him, the Christ. In him, the Christ, we were also chosen, which was determined beforehand in accordance with the purpose of him who works all things according to the deliberation of his own will, that we who previously hoped in the Christ should be unto the praise of his glory. In him, the Christ, you also, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation or deliverance, having also believed in him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the acquisition unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, ever since I heard of your believing in the Lord Jesus and your love to all the holy sanctified ones, I do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge or acknowledgement of him. In other words, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance, in the holy sanctified ones and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe that power in according to the working of the strength of his ability which he energized in the christ when he raised him from the dead and caused him to sit at his right side in the heavenly realm far above every ruler and authority and power and lordship even every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the coming age. He put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all people. And that's chapter one.